John, how's it going? Good. How you doing? A good, good, good. A little rainy day for this uh, fun uh, conversation we're going to have. But it was great to come here in Burlington to uh, signify for our little episode. Oh, welcome. Welcome here. So, John, uh, for those who don't know you, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me your background, how you kind of got into the supply chain, all that fun sure. stuff. Sure. Uh, my name is John Hansis. I'm the supply chain logistics manager for Signify. I've been doing logistics import export for about 20 years. Um, I actually started with an engineering background. And most of the time I segued into logistics because at the time they didn't have anyone to get our my sales jobs to a job site. So I ended up taking on the logistics activities to get my own stuff there. And it's kind of evolved from there. And then just over years of learning new things, new trips, new tricks, you know, different facets, different areas of the companies from biotech to pharmaceutical, uh, IT companies, and then now here with LED lights. So what, uh, first off, what, what type of engineer were you? I was mechanical. Mechanical engineer. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, what like what were you doing that required you to kind of be? Both well, I was working for a pump company. And it okay. was actually a couple towns over, and they were, we were designing positive displacement pumps for municipalities, wastewater. So they're big, heavy pumps on crates, on pallets, and now had to get transported to job sites. Um, and a lot of times, we really didn't have a logistics person there. So you find that your stuff's ready to ship, and it's sitting there for a week, two weeks, and you know you weren't getting credit until it was shipped. Right. So it was kind of, okay, how do I learn to move my own stuff? Um, and that's kind of where it was, okay, I had somebody else that was showing me how to do it. And then I kind of took it over from there. Um, and then that's kind of how the experience kind of rolled into away from engineering more into logistics. So prior to kind of trying to get yourself shipped, like how much knowledge did you have about supply chain logistics? None. That none? None. I was engineering. So it was, it was designing, it was doing CAD drawings. It was, you know, very little. Um, until I started doing some stuff for a nonprofit where they were donating educational textbooks to foreign countries. And I was working the warehouse. It was a college job, just kind of working the warehouse. So some of it you learn a little bit, you know, as part of, but you really didn't get a bigger picture of it. Right. And then, it, you know, as the stuff became more and more interesting and more and more challenging, I kind of leaned in towards that and, and really gravitating towards it. That's awesome. So what ended up bringing you to uh, Signify? Signify was, you know, in, it was something that I saw that the company walked the walk in the sense of their their main logo, their what they believe in, why they do what they do. Um, a big thing for me is I'm a big person with, you know, Simon Sinek and some of the books he puts out and, you know, your why. And I saw everything that they were putting online and then multiple interviews here. And it just very closely tied into what I wanted to do um, in coming here and, and the challenges that they were facing. Um, I, I saw it as a great challenge, a great opportunity and kind of jumped in head first and jumped right into the firefight. So I think uh, in like full disclosure, I mean, you and I've had a ton of background conversation. We've been talking for like you kind of were one of the first people that really jumped in. You're like, hey, supply chain's cool. Get excited. You kind of did all that for me. So why we want to have this episode today is really talking about what your kind of role is at Signify yes. and stuff and how you kind of approach the supply chain. So. I think first to start off, what is Signify? Helping kind of the audience who hasn't heard, what, what exactly are you guys doing here? Signify is we're basically the former Philips Lighting. So all of Philips Lighting became Signify. What we do is we produce LED lights that go into any area of the world. So we have different divisions, different brands. A large part of what I do here is project division. So you'll see lights, uh, you know, Empire State Building. You see major, um, you know, parks like the Seattle Seahawks, right. Seattle Mariners Dome all very publicly visible products, projects and so forth that we work on. So that you have to have an inherent interest in doing it because it's not something if you fail, it's no big deal. Right. It's you fail and a lot of people know you failed. Yeah. Um, so failure is not really an option. Um, <laughs> and then there's always some kind of difference. There's always kind of craziness going on. Um, you know, a lot of times we have projects that happen last minute, um, you know, and I've had that similar to what we had talked about before. You know, I've been in a meeting and an hour later I'm driving to an airport. Right. You know, because we had a big meeting, a customer needed this product, it needed to get out. We found out it wasn't ready. We thought it was a small project, 20, 30 pallets, a truckload. I get down there where, you know, I'm booking a hotel room in the Uber going to Logan Airport from here. <laughs> get down there to find out it's not 30 pallets, it's 100. Now I need three trucks. Now every one of these pallets had to have type labels for the contractors on the job site. So within a 24 to 36 hour window, we had to work down at the warehouse, getting all these labeled, getting them done and getting them out the door. And you had to be done before month end. So we literally had two days to make it happen. Now, we don't have to go in specific projects, but like 
talk to me a little bit of the complexity of these projects, why it's not as simple as, I mean, as like you say, right, it's big stadiums. I mean, it's, it's that it's yes. the lighting behind that. So what, it, how, like what type of quality is the product? Is that the big deal is that it's extremely complex, but at the same time, the quality that you're guys exactly most is- of what we pride ourselves on is superior quality um, and unsurpassed to anyone out there. Um, but the complexities that exist within your supply chain are not just getting the final product to the customer. It's your tier one, two, three suppliers. Right. You know, you may have products manufactured in all parts of the world, but the subcomponents come from other areas all over the world. All of what you need to get to the vendor have to get built and then move. So a lot of times there's that complexity that I have to deal with that the subcomponent level is now needs to get to there before they can even do the final build. And so a lot of times we're brought in saying, hey, you need to get this stuff from, you know, Mexico to Thailand, you know, and it needs to be there in two, three days in order to get this thing built for it to ship in two months to make a customer deadline. So there's a lot of the complexities. And then there's also it ties into procurement deals. It ties into a lot of other factors that, you know, it's as I call call supply chains, always organized chaos. Right. It's never smooth. It's never easy. But you got to love what you do and be able to call those audibles on the fly to make it happen. Um, Because at the end of the day, you're only as good as your last shipment. I can do a million shipments right. It's the one I do wrong that everyone remembers. Right. And that's kind of what we push here is that, you know, we ship with the same level of quality that we want and expect in our product. Um, And that's kind of what we push here, kind of the push with the metrics that I've been able to try to achieve here uh, since coming here. So one thing in you kind of, I love this little saying you say is that uh, I'm looking at is you'll always have unpredictability in supply chain. So you need to be a quarterback. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, how do you how do you become a quarterback for the supply chain? Well, a lot of times you find out that procurement had a deal or a sub vendor that makes a component is wanting a new price increase. And because you won't agree to the price or someone didn't agree to the price increase, they won't ship the product. They won't commit to the build because they know they can hold your feet to the fire. Right. So a lot of times you have these sub components that you now need to normally you're not involved in. You kind of get brought in the 11th hour. And then you find out, okay, I need to not only get all the subcomponents there, but I need to make sure they're there on time because you have different parts of the world. You know, we deal with things all the time where, you know, Chinese New Year, you have factories that shut down for weeks at a time. These are the things we have to know in advance. So when someone comes to me and say, oh, this isn't going to be a problem, I can say, yes, it is going to be a problem because they're going to be shut down in this part of the world for two weeks. That there's there's a strike going on at that airport. These are the things that we have to know exist in order to basically smooth out that wrinkle as much as possible. So how do you do that? I mean, you know, like you follow up. I mean, we're in New England based, right? Brady's like a a savant of the film room and stuff. Like, how are you quarterbacking? How do you study film? How do you get prepared? A lot of what we do here is, is similar to, you know, what, you know, big on LinkedIn, you know, podcasts, YouTube videos, different companies out there that produce certain content that it's, it's the content that goes out there. So it's, You try to know a little about a lot of things versus a lot about a little, you know, a few things. So the more you can learn, the more you can see it as going on outside the world. What's going on with the carriers? What's going on in the finance industry? What's going on with Customs Border Patrol? You know, all these things that you learn that you can pick up and, you know, I got a decent commute coming in here so I can listen to podcasts on my way in. And it's picking up those little bits of information that I know in the back of my head so that when a project comes to light, you can say, hey, listen, we need to be concerned about X, Y, Z. Right. Um, or, hey, listen, this is going on in this part of the world. You need to be concerned about this. You know, sometimes you get port congestion in L.A. OK, my audibles, I ship it up to Seattle and then come down. So I have we have backups and backups to the backup right. because we need to plan for those contingencies because at the end of the day, the customer doesn't care. They just want their product when they're supposed to get it. And you need to make that happen. Right. You know, at the end of the day, especially for your projects, exactly. you are just a, probably one component of probably a bunch of things that's going into yes. this whole like. A, a lot of times you have contractors that have to build stuff within a one week, two week window. Right. So they're ordering stuff six, seven months in advance. And it has to be there within a one and two week window because there's different facets of that project. You know, you look at like lighting the Empire State Building or lighting the domes or some of the the. Uh, theme parks that we do. Right. They have deadlines, they have time frames. they have construction crews in there and you have to work around that. So you need to make sure the product's there and they need to have the reliability and comfort in believing that you can make it happen. So I wanna go back real quick to the talking about the content kind of, I saw a cool thing, it's called like, informa- like 
instead of content marketing, they're calling it should be knowledge marketing. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure, especially with how much is out there now, like, cause you can go on your phone and the thing's just cramming with just nonstop information, but finding trusted sources, how are you as a supply chain manager kind of vetting those sources and knowing, Hey, this is good information I'm getting. And here's kind of stuff that's just a lot of times you can know in the first couple minutes listening to content when you're watching something or listening to something you know okay they're talking about something that's legitimate they're talking and they're knowledgeable about that setup yeah you know if if you're listening to someone and they're just kind of throwing in their two cents because it's their opinion well it doesn't really correlate to something relevant to the rest of the world it may just be for them right but when you're looking at something that's relevant for you as a company wide then you can say hey listen we really need to do this. And, you know, I'll share, I'll comment, you know, like on LinkedIn, other ones, we'll share, we'll save them, we'll record them, we'll, I'll go back and make notes on them. Right. And once you get those few reliable sources, you can continuously go back to those. And a lot of times, you know, you can reach out to them. Yeah. Hey, I'm encountering this. Did you encounter that? You know, we do that with like, we have logistics groups on in the main, our main corporate office in Eindhoven. There's a, you know, team, Microsoft Teams group. You can throw a question out there. Hey, anyone encountered this before? Oh yeah, I encountered it over here. And, you know, it's just tips and suggestions that you can do, plus just industry contacts. Right. You know, a lot of times when you've been doing it long enough, you you pretty much, there's never anything really new. It's more of, okay, just coming in a different format or scenario, you know, right. it may play out as one through five and now it's five through 10. So, you know, a lot of these ones you encounter and that's kind of why you need the team. It's not just one person. As a team, as you rely on, you can sit there and say, hey, we've encountered this this is how we dealt with it, or this is how we're going to encounter this. And a lot of times that's kind of what the content is that we even try to share within the company. We'll probably say, hey, you know, this is coming up. Keep in mind these, you know, the Chinese New Year. Oh, hey guys, keep in mind two weeks, this isn't gonna ship. What do you, you know, make sure you're aware of this beforehand so we don't get what we jokingly call chicken little syndrome with the skies falling with somebody, the skies always falling with somebody or somewhere across the world. It's just a matter of, how, how, do you, how do you make that work for them? You know, sometimes they just don't understand that complexity that, oh, I just ordered a part. Why can't it just ship? Yeah. And that actually kind of, it's a great transition. Thank you for that one. But talking about the changes. So the complexities are like Chinese New Year. These things that are going to constantly come up yes. are pretty easy. You learn it once. It's all practice. How much muscle memory you can put in to remember the stuff. But talk to me a little bit about the complexities that are arising as a uh, from e-commerce well, in this yeah, whole Amazon yeah, effect. Especially, you know, the Amazon effect with yeah. the e-commerce. You have so many customers now that are expecting things within a day or two. You know, they order something on Amazon Prime, it ships within a day. And a lot of times, you know, it's kind of the old adage in sales that a customer will always default to cheap if they're not made to understand the value. Right. So a, a newer customer doesn't really understand the LED market. They're willing to say, I'll take product A because I can get it two weeks sooner versus product B that might take two, three weeks longer, not realizing the value in what they get with certain things. And so a lot of times, you know, you know, it's commendable for Amazon because they got as big as they are because of the unrelenting pursuit of customer satisfaction. Everything they built went against, you know, Wall Street. Right. You know, they didn't, it was just, they were going to make customer satisfaction number one. And now it's rewarding them because of that. And a lot of times, I think that's a lot of things that customers, companies do that fail to recognize is that, you know, you need to start looking at things that you, you know, you expect people to buy from you because you're a certain name. You should be doing everything you do every single day to earn the right to sell to that customer. Right. And and I think those complexities, you know, as a result of the Amazon effect, a lot of customers now want something faster. They want something sooner. They don't understand why it might take something longer to do. And a lot of times, you know, that's what we have to point out is, Hey, listen, the quality is this, you know, we build lights that take lightning strikes, they're bridges, you know, there's certain things, you know, you're not going to pick this up off the shelf. You know, you're, you're talking about things that light up the facades of buildings. You're not going to get those at a general store. You know, these are custom made products. And that's kind of a big part of what Signify believes is what's called the power of light. How does that translate into people's lives? How does that translate into home? Right. The places you go, the things you do, how can light connect you to those things? And everything we do is a result of that. Yeah. And I've seen like a lot of the material you guys put out and everything. It's all it's super 
in- inspiring in the sense, I guess is exactly. the word. Like you guys are kind of making it and feel. that's why you have to, you have to love what you do. Right. And it's hard to find people like in this building, you look at the lobby, you know, it's you love what you do. You love it from the minute you get out of the elevator. You know, you're always going to have problems. You're always going to have complexities. It's never going to be easy. But at the end of the day, it's who you are. Like right. a lot of what I do in logistics is you understand there's complexity. So it's, you can roll with the punches. You right, know, right. you know, it's just, it's like, you know, shedding a defender if you're a quarterback. It's something's coming at you. Okay. It's no big deal. Sidestep it. Let's move on. But it's, it's doing it to the point that it becomes who you are, that you can, you know, you love so much of what you do that you have no problem listening to podcasts for an hour. You have no problem reading that magazine right. because it surrounds what you do and it makes you better at what you do for others. So it's not, you're not just doing it for a paycheck. You're doing it because you love what you do and your success is a result of that. So what motivates you about the supply chain? Especially just because your energy and your passion alone. I mean, I, yeah, listening to a, a podcast for an hour is, sure, you're giving up a little bit more of your time instead of having like the life stuff. But you leave meetings and go on an airplane to, to leave it. Yes. Like, what motivates you? How do you have so much passion? Yeah, I love what I do. I love the fact that there's always a different challenge. It's not you come in and you're doing the same thing every single day. You're essentially doing the same thing, but there's always something different. Right. There's always some hiccup. There's always some problem. So it's it, you're looking at it from a problem solving standpoint that you love the challenge. You love that someone throws the gauntlet at you and says, this isn't going to happen. But yeah. Oh, you know, I can do that. Watch this. You know, and that's kind of what you love that the fact that senior managers like this company can rely on me and the team that we have here that we'll get the job done. Everyone's saying it's not going to happen. You have 24 hours to get the shipment out. Okay. I got 24 hours. You know, you say, oh, you, know, you only have 24 hours. I look at it and say, I have 24 hours. There's a lot I can do in 24 hours. You know, like I said, we've done stuff when we've done it on a plane ride. You know, I'm booking a hotel on a plane ride down. I'm getting, I'm calling vendors to get trucks lined up saying, hey, I don't know what I'm going to run into but I need to plan for ABC. I need you on call. Okay, no problem. So when I get there, you know, I tie that into the relationship I have with the carriers. They know how involved I am and how passionate like me and the team are here that we don't have the ability to have it, oh, we might get this or we, oh, we'll have this ready. It, it needs to be ready or it's not going to happen. Right. You know, because some of these projects are millions of dollars. Right. You know, you're not talking, oh, four or 5,000. Some of these things are two, $3 million. And so if you fail at that, Someone failed. You failed sales. You right. failed your manager. You failed everybody because you couldn't get something done. And that's kind of where we look at it as is I will do everything humanly possible to make it happen. And yes, you're not always going to make it happen, but you will get it done to the point that you can be relied on to make that happen. How do you combat the stress of working in logistics and especially transportation where like some stuff just isn't on you, especially as like the exactly. quarterback? How do you so how do, what's your kind of secret to like? I, I would say there's definitely no secret sauce. It's just you survive <laughs> on caffeine and no sleep. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of it because, you know, there's other complexities that exist. Like right. I can't ship a product that's not ready. If it's not ready, you know, I can't ship something that procurement hasn't bought. I can't ship something that the vendor hasn't made yet. So there's a lot of things that I can't control. And I know that. So I have to create contingency plans for every level of that. Right. Is OK. What if. These guys fail. Well, we, you know, predominantly we may ship ocean. Okay, well, now I need to ship air. Now when it gets there, I need to have a team pick that up and send it straight to the customer. So there's all these complexities that a lot of times are outside your control, but you have to work and involve. So it may be setting up a 20, 30 minute with procurement teams. Hey guys, what's going on? What issues are you finding? Hey sales, what, you know, what can we do to help you? Right. You know, the sales managers that are here, we, and you know, cause a lot of what we do, we have what's called VAPs or value added partners. We sell to them, they sell to the end user most of the time. Um, so a lot of times we're in between with them, but their success or failure is also closely tied to our own. You know, so a lot of times you don't want to let that person down because there's other people that are involving. And that's kind of one of the things I look at is I will never fail my company because I didn't do my part. Right. Or I'm not willing to do my part. I'm willing to do everything I can and then some to make it happen because that's what we believe in as a company. So... I guess for our listeners or our viewers watching, uh, what what success or what's some advice you'd have for them, especially with that communication piece of it? How how what kind of do you do? What's your approach when it comes to communication? I think you got to make sure you don't have the blinders on. A lot of times, too many people put blinders on and are only concerned about what's on the left or the right in between their hands. Right. What's on their desk? 
They're not concerned about what happens before it or after. Hey, I did my part at somebody else. Not realizing you're essentially a spoke in a wheel. If you don't do your part, the wheel doesn't move. So you can, you can have a, an all-star in one part, but you can fail in others. And, that, and that's kind of what I have to look at is you have to be able to be concerned about the entire supply, right. the entire, you know, any job you do, even if it's you know, logistics, whatever it is, you need to be concerned about the whole piece. How does that tie in? And how do you play your part in that? And that's kind of one of the, another thing I like, I love with this company is that we know what our boss's metrics are. We know what their goals are because it ties down to our own. So they, you have a global goal and then it's broken down by region, by division. So it's complete transparency that you can see, okay, this is what my boss needs to tackle this year. And I can look at it and go, how do I help them tackle this? How do I do my part to help them get to that part? Right. And everyone can see that. So that's kind of one, one of the big things I like is that, you know, it's never going to be sunshine and rainbows, especially in this industry. But the fact that you can go and sit down with somebody, have a conversation, whether a nice conversation or not nice conversation, but have that dialogue to help say, hey, listen, I'm having a problem. How do we fix it? Versus not saying anything, let it hit a bottleneck and then say, oh, I did my part. So I don't know what the problem is. You know, and I think that's kind of one of the biggest things is always be learning, right. always be willing to do like I do a lot of times now, like on LinkedIn, you can sign up for, um, you know, advice. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of people that reach out. Hey, I'm 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 new to supply chain. What should I look for? Or, hey, I'm just starting out. I'm encountered this, but I watched your YouTube video. How did you come? You know, how do I go about this? Or who should I reach out to? And, and that's kind of the you know, one of the things I really love is that it comes full circle. It's stuff that I've learned that now I can help teach, like even the intern we have here stuff that I can help teach him that he may not even thought of before, but now he knows it. So now when he takes this out to the real world, he can say, oh, I remember that, right? right? You know, and I told him, you can either read a case study or live through one. Right. And that's kind of one of the biggest things I wanted for him was, you know, I want you to get dirty. I want you to see this. I want you to be ready to pull your hair out at these projects because this is what you're going to face. This isn't what a book's going to tell you you're going to encounter. This is the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what you're going to face on a regular basis. And you either need to love it and embrace it or you need to find something else to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, listen, you can watch all the game tape you want. You still need to practice exactly. so you get in the muscle memory. And you're still going to take a few hits every once in a while. So that's always, you know, <laughs> right. that's a common thing. Uh, Jesus, so much like we're, we're talking all this fun stuff. Um, metrics wise, what do you... What do you find valuable? What are you measuring? What are you kind of looking at? A lot at? of what, what, for me personally here is we, uh, a big part of what I was brought in to do was inland transit reduction. Mm -hmm. So we have vendors in, you know, main China, Hong Kong, and then they ship ocean all the way to here. You know, when we were first starting this, when I came in, they were averaging 55 to 60 days from the port to the delivery to our distribution center. Um, currently we're at 28 days. So I've pretty much cut it in half because once you break it down and see, okay, where is that problem? Where is it, you know, where is the bottleneck? And then reverse engineer your solution to that. Right. You can cut it down and now you can go to sales. You can go to your boss and say, hey, we're now gonna get our product here this much sooner. This can translate to this much more in sales. Or, you know, getting that faith from your customers. You know, if they don't like you have a long lead time, Hey, guess what? We've cut it from this time to this time. Yes, it's not perfect. We're getting there. Like I have phase two that comes in next year, which is going to be mind blowing to a lot of people, but it will be a huge change for what our customers have seen. Yeah. And, but I've only been able to do that because of faith in their bosses, the senior managers, like things that we can push to tie into it because they believe in what's doing right for the customers. Right, right. You know, a lot of our metrics are driven from customer surveys. We get the VAPs, hey, good, bad, and the ugly here. What do you have to say about this, this, and this? And we get to see those. So we get to see what that guy wrote at some event in San Diego. We get to see exactly what they said. And then you can look at it and go, okay, I need to fix that. Right. And, and that's what I like is that open dialogue that you have that ability to see things throughout the whole spectrum versus only seeing a little portion of it, not realizing that it's affecting somebody else. What... And I'm sorry for like, these are like coming at me rapid fire, just but as you speak, there's hey, so much happens. energy. We go yeah. with the flow. It's also, you're watching, <laughs> witnessing me trying to keep this microphone from not falling in my face every time. Uh, what, from giving your background of the engineer, what's an element? Because I think it's a really cool, unique perspective you have and a different kind of skill set that you brought into this uh, where you weren't kind of doing like the other kind of supply chain management yes. or like doing business. You came from an engineering 
What's an element of engineering that you feel really helps you be successful as a supply chain logistics manager? I think it's, you know, it's the old engineering principle. They called it the KISS principle. You know, keep it simple, <laughs> stupid. Yeah. Like you don't need to over complex, you know, over overdo these things. There's there's a process, there's a way, there's a way of work that you can do to make these things happen. And you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to say, okay, what do I need to do? How do I need to do it? What do I need to get there and, and create a metric, create an approach, you know, even, you know, we used to call it, you know, scientific method in engineering and creating a, you know, hypothesis. It's, it's just reverse engineering. It's taking it as how do I find a solution? What's the best way for the company to do this? Right. Not the easiest way for me just to pass it on to somebody else, but what can I do to make the customer and the company successful? And I think that's a big part of, you know, from an engineering background that, you have that structured approach yeah. and that, you know, you can approach it from the same thing each time, but also you understand other complexities out there. You know, a lot of times, you know, even in engineering, you never know what you're going to encounter. You know, you go out in the field and you, you know, you're told it's this and you get there and it's something completely different. Right. You know, the, the, the you know, in, in the pumping industry, you know, the pipes bigger than it was, it was not in the wrong spot. So you find out, oh, I got to do all these changes on the fly on site. And that's kind of, you know, similar to the supply chain is you all of a sudden find out, hey, these aren't shipping from vendor A that I was told. These aren't shipping from vendor B. Right. And now, oh, that's going to, you know, now because of tariffs and things like that, that's going to change the whole complexity to get it there on time. Now I need to cause these audibles to happen in order to get the customer their product. So we're going to start to wrap up. We're kind of hitting a little bit of time. It's this is going to be an interesting one. What keeps you up at night? Mine is, is the, you know, the complexity as we talk about so many customers out there wanting something tomorrow. Like we have a different version of our stuff called made to stock. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you buy it, it ships within 48 hours. Right. But then you have the complexity ones that can take weeks to build. You know, you deal with certain uh, theme parks that you do these huge projects. Well, they want a specific light. Now, light comes in different spectrum. So you got to fine tune this thing right. and then mass produce it for these guys. It's not something easy. So what my biggest thing that keeps me up at night is, is being able to keep up with and beat that curve. Right. Explaining to your customers, the people you're working with that, you know, quality comes at a cost, but also once it ships, you know, we're going to do everything we can to get it to you as fast as possible. And that's kind of why, like, I always take phone calls. You know, my phone's always on. You know, if and the crazy thing is because we deal with so many other areas of the world, you know, if I'm not on te Microsoft Teams, I get WeChat, Skype, you know, I get to ch team in China pinging me nine, 10 o'clock at night. Right. You know, it, it happens, but this is what you do when you have that. So you're trying to, you know, smooth out that process for your company, knowing that a lot of people are looking at your competitor saying, well, I'll sacrifice a little quality to get it faster. Right. And in my part, I look at is what can I do to help our company, help our sales guys get that product faster to them and eliminate that curve. You know, so now if I eliminate their ability to compare, say, oh, we're not getting it for six weeks. Well, now I get six weeks. OK, now you're getting superior quality in the same time frame. Now the argument's not even in there anymore. Right, right. And that's kind of what I look at is what can I do to keep my part to help the company, to help sales, help push the company to be better tomorrow than they were today. Um, and, and it's that unrelenting pursuit that you're never satisfied. You're never happy with what you did because you realize, oh, I finished this project, but I could have done this, this and this. But you know you're happy. Tell me. Oh, I, yeah. you, you, I, you love what you do. Right, you know, right. I, I love it. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, people here, you know, they see the energy. But I think that's kind of the part that becomes contagious is that they see that we're one of the departments, you know, logistics, as anyone knows, is. I always joke and they say is the bastard stepchild of any family, you know, of a company. You have it where you're given the least amount of credit, right. you're given the most amount of stress and the least amount of reliability in or brought into the conversation. You're brought in last. Right. You know, and that's kind of where if they see our group here and we're laughing, we're, you know, we know this, you know, and, and that's kind of a joke for us is, OK, come at us with something. <laughs> we'll, we'll, you know, we, we're not going to be able to solve everything, but. Hey, we're going to take it with a grain of salt. We know what's coming. You we know burn, we, take it on, we know we know someone's got chicken little today, so it's it's going to happen. You know, I can tell just from people that walk by looking in. You know, I, I have nine million escalations by the time I get to my desk. <laughs> it's going to happen. You know, but you, if when you love what you do, it's it's a challenge, and you got you got to love the ability to say, okay, you know what? Nine people now are relying on me to give them an answer. Right. Not oh my god, I have nine things to do for nine different people. It's 
nine people are having a problem with their job that now relates to something I either did or didn't do yeah. or need to do. And that's kind of where we look at that challenge and say, okay, game on. You know, it's kind of like the proverbial hold my beer. You know, we can, we can do this. You know, that's why we take those challenges. And, and you know, you're in a meeting with a general manager. An hour later, you're in an Uber going to the airport. You know, or like the last one, big one we moved to where else? We were two weeks straight on the road. You know, right. I was here a month and a half and I spent Christmas Eve in New York because of the first one of the first projects that we had. Wow. You know, so you look at it going, you know, I'm Christmas Eve. I'm sitting in New York because we needed to get a project done. And I wasn't going to let it not happen because I wanted to go home. It was, hey, you know, I got a job to do. I'm going to make it happen. I send an email. It's done. It's signed for. I'm on my way home. Right. And that 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 reliability that you want people to have in you to make that happen. Like it's December. It's end of month, end of year. A lot of people are going to start coming saying, hey, I need a number. I need this. Right, I, right. So I know it's coming. So it's going to, you know, right now we kind of have an internal joke of how many problems that we're going to have. So we have a going bet of how many, you know, situations we're going to face within the next two weeks. Um, you know, but it, it, it's kind of going with the flow. You, you know, at the end of the day, I love it. I love the challenge. I love coming in and someone doing a challenge to me. It's, you know, I love to fight, you know, and that's kind of, you know, always fighting, always forward kind of a thing. That right, right. You, 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 either, you know, you either learn, you're not really losing, you're always learning. You know, so even if you fail at something, you learn for something. So uh, let's wrap up. And I want to wrap up with this final question of what, like, you got so much passion. You're so happy. I mean, it's a month and a half in. And you're like, you know what? Christmas Eve, I got to be doing this. What's the project that you're most proud of? I think one of the ones that we're most proud of is, I would say there was a bridge project that we did. And this was the big one that a week before we were told it's not going to happen until the next month. Okay. Two days later, I'm hearing panic calls from, you know, we had the sales manager here and the general manager were sitting having a conversation and they kind of waved us over. And that's never a good thing when you have the GM and the top VAP sales manager in a conversation and they said, hey, this needs to happen. And we're like, wait, we were told it wasn't. Well, no, sales has put this into the numbers. So now it needs to happen. What do you need to do to happen? We're like, we need to go. <laughs> you know, and like we have travel budgets. So like you, you're not supposed to travel within 14 days without not without getting everything signed off. Right, right. So it was like, hey, I got to violate every protocol in the company to, just to travel. And, you know, that they look at us and said, go. So it was like, OK, as we're finishing a conversation, I'm buying tickets on Delta. Yeah. We're in the Uber. I'm booking a hotel and I had no clothes packed. It was nothing but my computer bag. We bought clothes at a Walmart at two in the morning when we landed. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we had. It was okay. This is what we need to do. Right. We were at the warehouse the next morning. And that's when an order that was 30 pallets became a hundred. Every single box had to be labeled on all 100 pallets within a 24 hour window. So we were at our warehouse with the, with the company we were doing stuff with. They were fantastic to work with. We did it. We pulled it off. All three trucks got out before the month end. And then, you know, we, we had pictures. So I, I took a picture of the floor and it looked like the apocalypse. Yeah. And the sales manager's like, what's that? I'm like, that's your project. I'm like, this is how much, because there was complexities that a lot of these pallets were double stacked and they counted them as one. So, oh, we have one pallet. No, you have two double stacked pallets. So now I'm three 53 foot trailers within short notice, dedicated team driver to get it to the customer. Yeah. And we shipped it out. So we ended up sending an email. All three are gone, signed, sealed, delivered. Because as soon as they're off the docks, we're, we're done as far as we're, we're done. We're, the the billing side's done right right so as soon as it ships we're good so you know we were sending that message saying it's all done and they're like you guys actually pulled it off not only <laughs> did we pull it off but we pulled off something that was four times the size of what you thought even on the plane ride down right right and then you get to the warehouse and go houston we have a problem because you're looking at it going this isn't what we were told <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know and then it was it was just a different labeling on the on a product that became much larger so you know, Vern and I were down there and it was just like, okay, let's get it done. You know, and it was just no, okay, we're going to sit in a conference room and have these, you know, paralysis through analysis, 9 million ways to go about it. It's no, let's just go get it done. Right. And we went there and we get it done and you move on. And we've had two projects, you know, that are like that, but that one definitely takes the cake with the, you know, you're flying with nothing but your laptop bag and no clothes and just, okay, let's go make it happen. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, you know, but then the, the fact that everyone knows that and then you get, you know, people know that you went through that link to do that, that you have that reliability that the next time it happens, yes, they come to us. Right. But we did our part to make the company successful 
we have, you know, the, the not only the company, but our customer, we were able to get it to them when they needed it, Yeah, yeah. you know, and without an issue. Yeah. That's you know, awesome. And, and that's kind of the things that, you know, those are the things you love at the end of the day. Those are, you know, you have a lot of those kind of projects. Well, where do you see, like, where else would you have that type of experience? Like, exactly. Oh, you know, and that's really kind of cool. where, you know, with the intern that we have here, I keep telling them that you can read about case studies, but you're never going to read about something like this. Right, right. Because they're going to give you this smaller thing that you can learn. I'm like, when you're ready to pull your hair out and you're on a plane ride with nothing information, this is when it happens. Right. This is when your learning takes this is where, you know, between Vern and I, with all the years experience that we have, he's been here 19 years, you know, between the two of us, there's nothing we haven't encountered. Right. So we both approach things from two different angles, but combine them to make it happen. So it was, you know, we're on the plane. Okay. This is what we need to do. Do this, m get it done, make it happen out the door. Awesome. Um, you know, and that's kind of, you know, what we do. And it's just, you know, it's what we love to do. It's what keeps us going and it's on to the next challenge, which I'm sure is only about. 15 steps away when I get out the door. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we'll wrap up then. John, you talked about it. You, your open book. You want to be communicated with. What's the best way for a listener or viewer to get in touch with you? Uh, basically LinkedIn. You know, I, I don't do a lot of the other social medias, but like LinkedIn is kind of the best way to reach right. out to me. My email's on there. My cell phone's on there. Um, you know, and a lot of times I get those messages, just different questions, different advice. You know, and sometimes you join the groups, you know, like, right. you know, even the trans tech group. You know, we brought the intern to that. These are the things you love to do to be able to give back content. You have all this experience. Well, it's nothing if you're not passing it on. Right. It's not nothing if you're not helping the next group that's coming up. Yeah, it's all common shared experience. You know, so it, it's nothing through. proprietary. Right. It's no secret sauce. It's, right. it's this is just, it, it's, it's organized chaos at its best, but you got to be able to be comfortable to roll with the punches. Right, right, right. And, and I think the more comfortable you get with that complexity and knowing that it's never going to be perfect or smooth, the easier it is to kind of make these things happen. Awesome. So I'll include the link to your LinkedIn page yep. in the show notes uh, and people can get in contact with you there. But thanks, John. Thanks for letting oh, me come you. here. We're going to walk around. I want to like, yep. see what the building's like and all that stuff. See all the cool lights. Yep. Sounds good. All right, John. Thanks for all joining All right. Thank me. you. Are you a supply chain quarterback? What type of attitude do you think makes a great supply chain manager? Leave a comment in the video and let me know. In the meantime, enjoy past episodes of Consulting Logistics and subscribe to us by clicking the subscription button. Thanks for watching Consulting Logistics. I'm Kyle McNaught. Peace.